In the summer of 1940, in the skies above Britain, the Royal Air Force won a victory that changed history. In the Battle of Britain, as it became known, its fighters fought off a German Air Force four times their number, and in doing so, saved Britain from invasion. It was this plane, the Spitfire, that has taken the glory for this astonishing achievement. A brilliant fighter, technically advanced and graced with beautiful lines, it quickly became what it has remained to this day, a legend. But for the pilots who actually took on the Luftwaffe, there is another unsung hero, the Hawker Hurricane. Slower, uglier and less glamorous than the Spitfire, this is the fighter that nevertheless actually made the greatest contribution to winning the Battle of Britain. Im äh, England Einsatz war für uns die Hurricane natürlich äh, das gefährlichste Flugzeug, was wir bis äh, dahin als Gegner hatten. It scored 64% of all the victories over German aircraft during the Battle of Britain. And without the Hurricane, we wouldn't have won, there's no doubt at all. More enemy airplanes were shot down by Hurricanes and Spitfires. But pretty well every newsman will always tell you that it was the Spitfire that won the Battle of Britain. Well, in fact, it didn't. The Hurricane won the Battle of Britain, helped by the Spitfire. The Hurricane was conceived as early as 1933, when the idea of a single-winged aircraft was a revolutionary one. It was designed to be Britain's first modern monoplane fighter, capable of over 300 miles per hour and robust enough to have eight machine guns mounted in the wing. The RAF, however, had no plans to take on new models. A period of general disarmament had greatly reduced it, and the flying establishment remained wedded to the biplane. Monoplanes were a bit risky. There had been one or two monoplane fighters in the First World War, which hadn't really been a success. And I think that people uh, were afraid of the aer aerodynamic technology that was necessary to build them. The Germans had no such inhibitions. Hitler was now rearming his air force and spearheading it with a revolutionary new single-wing fighter designed by Willy Messerschmitt, the ME-109. Sidney Cam, chief designer at one of Britain's largest aircraft manufacturers, Hawker Aviation, was determined that Britain should not be outdone. And he persuaded Hawker to design the new fighter as a private venture. His objective was to build the world's best fighter all round, not just in any one particular, but in all respects. It had to be faster, it had to be easier to build, it had to have the best armament, and it had to be easy to fly. In making the best possible fighter, Cam's design became a marriage of the old and the new. Features such as the enclosed cockpit, the retractable undercarriage, machine guns in the wings. These were all radical. But in basic construction, the Hurricane was a direct descendant of a long line of successful Hawker biplanes, such as the First World War fighter, the Sopwith Camel, and the more recent Hawker Fury. The Hurricane still used traditional methods of construction with a wooden slatted surround structure, which gave the shape aerodynamic shape to the aircraft. This was then covered with fabric, which was sewn to the wooden shape and held in position by long wooden slats. It had the aerodynamic shape. Now it needed the thrust to reach 300 miles per hour. With impeccable timing, Rolls-Royce had just developed the first of a new breed of 1,000 horsepower engines. It was called the Merlin and became the most successful aero engine of World War II. The government was finally persuaded to pay for a prototype, and in November 1935, the Hurricane was flight tested with great success. It would be five months before the first experimental Spitfire got off the ground. But the government didn't commit themselves to an order. Tom Sopwith, head of Hawkers, however, could see there would be a need for his new fighter and made an historic decision. With no orders in the pipeline, he sank a million pounds into hurricane production. The result of that was we had about 150 more hurricanes when the Battle of Britain started than we would otherwise have had. And those 150 airplanes were critical to the fact that the RAF could take on the Luftwaffe and cope with the 
numbers of German aircraft being sent across the Channel. By 1936, the government had at last woken up to the threat posed by German rearmament. The RAF would get its fighters. Spitfires and Hurricanes went into full production. But being much easier to build, it was the Hurricane which entered full service first in late 1937. The RAF is climbing back to that old supremacy which made it the most formidable air force at the end of the war. And the new types of fighting machines are beginning to reach the squadrons in large numbers. This is the first time you've seen the Hurricanes in flight. Take a good look at them, for they represent a big factor in the world's estimation of British might. By June 1940, Hitler's army had occupied northern France, and the invasion of England was planned for August. Britain stood alone. The threat to this country in the summer of 1940 was the most dire threat the nation had faced since the Norman invasion. Hitler knew that he would have to annihilate the RAF before he could invade. Britain had just 347 hurricanes and 244 Spitfires and other fighters with which to defend itself. But the Luftwaffe had over 2,000 bombers and fighters, and its pilots came battle-hardened from a string of successful campaigns across Europe. They saw no difficulty in the task ahead. Da waren wir, hatten wir den Eindruck, dass wir also überlegen waren. Wir hatten also keine Bedenken, nach England also überzusetzen. Ja, die äh, Moral war äh, gut, ich will sagen sogar sehr gut, denn äh, wir waren bis dahin ja äh, immer erfolgreich mit unseren Einsätzen. The battle began in mid-July. The Luftwaffe's first targets were shipping convoys in the Channel and coastal ports. The whole object of this exercise was to try to draw fighter command to battle and to inflict as much damage on fighter command before the main air offensive started as was possible to do. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven German dive bombers. There's one going down on his target now. Bomb. No, he missed the ship. But now the British fighters are coming up. The Hurricanes were told to attack the bombers, leaving the Spitfires to deal with the faster ME-109 fighters. Members of Spitfire just behind the first two. He'll get them. Well, yes, I will. Just hit a measure, Smith. Oh, that was beautiful. The RAF fighters have really got there. It was the Spitfire's success in dogfights with the Messerschmitts that made it famous. But British survival depended more on bringing down the bombers. And it was the Hurricane that was winning this crucial battle. The German bombers weren't terribly well armed because the battles that they had been in up to now with other countries they hadn't had the trouble with the fighters, and so they didn't need the defences, and they didn't need the guns. They had them all right, but, but not uh, as much as we had. We had eight machine guns firing forward, each firing 20 rounds of 303 ammunition a second. And a terrific firepower, you see. It is a real joy to be sitting in this cockpit again after 55 odd years. This is the gun button. By pressing this gun button, you could fire all your guns, but only for 14 seconds, then they ran out. 2,400 rounds would go in 14 seconds, so we tended to fire in two seconds bursts. You quickly get used to conserving your ammunition, because it's one way of saving your life in the inevitable dogfights that happen. But the real test came when the Hurricane found itself up against the dreaded Messerschmitt with its greater speed and deadly cannon. But the less fancied Hurricane had one trick up its sleeve the 109s could not match. We, the Hurricane pilots, knew we could outturn the 109 by outturning it, going around the smaller uh, circle. If you both were turning, he was trying to shoot you down, given a few turns and you were in a position to shoot at him. The plan to destroy the RAF over the channel wasn't working. In four weeks of fighting, the Luftwaffe lost 286 planes to the RAF's 150. Hitler's patience was wearing thin, 
and he ordered the main offensive to begin. Non-stop raiding of airfields and radar stations on the south coast to destroy the RAF on the ground. Unsere Aufgabe war die Flugplätze auf Südengland. Sie sind ja immer in größeren Verbänden geflogen. Es war absolut eine Sicherheit. Fighter Command were hugely outnumbered. Small groups of RAF fighters would regularly intercept formations ten times their size. It forced them to adopt an almost suicidal tactic. They would attack head-on, something that required absolute confidence in the hurricane, split-second timing, and nerves of steel. You're never going to break up a big formation with seven hurricanes. You're not going to break up a hundred by just coming in behind them. All you'll do is pick off one or two. But if you attack them from the front, there's a good chance you'll make the, make the formations break to avoid you. And then after that, uh, you can get back in and start to try to attack individual airplanes. There wasn't time for body tactics. Our tactics were to, to attack the enemy as quickly as possible. You got straight into a melee and it was every man for himself. To destroy the enemy, one had to get close. With the Hurricane, you could do that. It was a very maneuverable airplane. You could pull it away quickly. I sometimes got very close and, and had German oil all over my windshield. In the extreme circumstances of air fighting, you do things with airplanes which they're never really supposed to do. And we learnt very soon that you couldn't break a hurricane. You couldn't say the same for the Spitfire. It was built like the fourth bridge. Um, I brought them back with, without a rudder, with half an elevator, with a great big hole in the wing that a bloke could fall through. And, they, it, and I've landed it and uh, hardly been aware of the extent of damage until I saw it after I got back on the ground. That's the characteristic of a hurricane. And when the hurricane did suffer battle damage, it could be repaired much more easily than the Spitfire. Here we have the covering for the hurricane. And this is, believe it or not, Irish linen. Irish linen, which will cover the entire fuselage of the Hurricane. And believe it or not, this very Irish linen was a very useful fact of making the Hurricane a more efficient war machine, because she could be repaired with a piece of fabric put on top of the old piece and doped on, and we could be flying it again in 10 minutes. Whereas the poor old Spitfire, if it got a bullet in it, it was metal, had to go away to the metal shops and be remetalled. It was a big change. And to think, uh, Dennis, that we trusted our lives to this. That's quite a thought. <laughs> and as airfields became pitted with craters after repeated bombing, pilots came to value another of the hurricane's features. Its undercarriage was much wider than the Spitfires, which made it much safer to land on difficult ground. In fact, it seemed there was nowhere the hurricane couldn't land, as James Sanders discovered when his plane ran out of fuel and he had to make an emergency landing in a small field. I pancaked the aircraft, uh, to my surprise, all in one piece. I was taken by the farmer to the police station and I commandeered 60 gallons of car petrol and the locals helped me to refuel. And then a crowd of them held the aircraft down as I revved it up and started it. And I went off like a lift. So that was ordinary car petrol. And I flew back to Kenley as if nothing had happened. I was back in operations two hours later. The hurricane was proving itself to be the right plane at the right time and the preferred choice for many of the pilots. If anything, the Spitfire was nicer to fly. But for actual fighting a war, you couldn't better this aeroplane. I would never have swapped my Hurricane for a Spitfire. 
the buzz started to go around our dispersal that we were going to be re-equipped with Spitfires. The following day, the whole lot of us who weren't on duty arrived at the squadron commander's office. You could say it was almost a petition. And we said, sir, stop this. Please stop this. Spitfires will be lovely, but don't let's uh, change before the end of the battle. Let's finish this one on the hurricane. And uh, we never did. In the fiercest fighting of the battle between the 13th and 31st of August, the Luftwaffe lost 435 planes to fighter commands 261. It was a good tally for the RAF, but it was under severe strain. Its bases were badly damaged and it had ever fewer men and planes to draw on. By now, the average life expectancy of a Battle of Britain pilot was just two weeks. It's very hard for people to realize today that you sit down to breakfast with somebody and he's never seen again after that meal. And it's a terrible loss, really. But so much so that as to an individual, I stopped making friends who were other pilots. And the hurricane had one real design flaw. The main fuel tank was situated right in front of the pilot behind the instrument panel. It posed a real hazard, as Geoffrey Page was to discover when his was struck by enemy fire. The temperature in the cockpit, the estimate goes from about a comfortable room temperature up to 3,000 degrees centigrade in 10 seconds. Well, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade, so if you're not out in under 10 seconds, you will dead mutton. Geoffrey Page got out just in time, but many didn't. The demand was for more and more pilots. New recruits, little more than school leavers, were being rushed through the training schools. And learning to fly was one thing. Learning to fight was quite another. The total number of hours I'd got in on hurricanes was just 20 hours and we're being called on to go into squadrons with inadequate training on the gunnery side, which after all was the absolute key to the whole business, to shoot. A friend of mine carried out two attacks on an enemy bomber with his guns at safe. That means they wouldn't fire anyway. But he just didn't realize that his guns weren't working because he didn't know what to expect. He thought, my. They are very silent, these guns. But while there was a shortage of trained pilots, hurricanes were plentiful. Their traditional structure turned out to be a real asset. The dear old hurricane, which, um, because of its rather simple construction, could be produced in with 10,000 man-hours, whereas the Spitfire, despite its glamour, took 15,000 hours to build. Hurricanes were being kept in the air, but the pilots were finding it hard to keep going. Weeks of relentless fighting were taking their toll. An unexpected reprieve came on the 7th of September. Hitler ordered his air chief, Hermann Goering, to change tactics and attack London in retaliation for a British bombing raid on Berlin. With terrible irony, the bombing of civilian targets in London was to give fighter command bases on the south coast a much needed respite from attack and a chance to restore combat power. Then, on September the 15th, came the most decisive day of the battle. There's a major raid developing to the southeast. Target, presumed London. 350 bombers with fighter escorts were sent over to deliver a knockout blow on London. Rate for 8,000 feet, 50 aircraft. Rate 48, 11,000 feet, 100 plus. Sir Hugh Dowding, Commander in Chief of Fighter Command, ordered nearly every fighter remaining in the southeast to intercept. 32 hurricane squadrons and 20 Spitfire squadrons were waiting for the bombers as they crossed the channel. Of all the acts of bravery carried out that day, few were as startling as that of pilot officer Ray Holmes. His hurricane had already brought down two bombers when he noticed a third had eluded him. 
There was St. Paul's Cathedral, there was Buckingham Palace and all these places. And he was on a dead straight line for all these places. And as far as I was concerned, he wasn't going to get there. As I got within firing range, about 400 yards, uh, I opened fire and immediately the gun spluttered and got nothing left. Out of ammunition, Ray decided to use his Hurricane's robust airframe as a weapon, with consequences not even he could have predicted. And I knew now that the only way of getting this chap down was to take his tailplane off. His tailplane was looking so fragile there, and to me it looked like a model aeroplane, as if you could just chop it. Uh, and I thought my wing at that speed would go right through his tail and take the, take the tail off. Instead of taking the piece of the tail off that I wanted to take off, he took the whole of the twin tail section. Amazingly, the result of Ray's daring attack was captured by a cameraman. This is the Dornier coming down. This is the fuselage with the wingtips missing and the tail missing. And this is the tail. And they both came down together and landed on Victoria Station. The tally that day was 56 enemy kills, with most of the victories, possibly as many as 40, going to hurricane pilots. It was enough to convince the Luftwaffe they were not going to win air supremacy, and two days later, plans for the invasion of Britain were postponed indefinitely. The Spitfire and the Hurricane had formed a partnership that not even the biggest and best equipped air force in the world could defeat, but it was the Hurricane that had done most of the damage. Hurricanes were found to have shot down 860 German aircraft, plus or minus one or two, and the Spitfire 485, plus or minus one or two. So the Hurricane really was the dominant victor of the Battle of Britain, and the Hurricane shot down more German bombers and the same number of German fighters as the Spitfire. But the war was far from over, and whereas the Hurricane had been the plane for the moment, the Spitfire was the plane for the future. After the battle, the authorities thought, right, now we're in for a long war, which are we going to develop? And they looked at the two and they thought there was more room to develop the Spitfire and put bigger, big, bigger engines into it than there was in the Hurricane. Because of that, with each stage of development, you got a new Spitfire with a bigger engine that was going to go faster. The Spitfire squadrons and pilots thought they were the, they were the greatest and quite understandably so, and a great feeling of Spitfire elitism grew. But to the users, to the Hurricane pilots in, 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 in that period, in, in the Battle of Britain, the Hurricane was a very superior aeroplane. And the Hurricane's war was not over. Its versatility meant that it went on to serve in more theatres of war than any other fighter. In the North Atlantic, it was robust enough to be catapulted off merchant ships to fight the German long-range reconnaissance plane, the Fokker-Wolf Condor. Over 3,000 were sent to Russia to provide escort protection for Russian bombers, and they survived Arctic winters. They were rearmed with anti-tank guns and sent to the North African desert, where they became known as tank busters for the devastating effect they had on Rommel's army. And the Hurricane was the only fighter that could keep flying during the monsoon. It went to Burma, where it was fitted with 250 and 500 pound bombs and became a crucial factor in stopping the Japanese advance towards India. The last of 14,533 hurricanes came off the production line in February 1944. Now in Britain, there are only three still flying. If there is to be an epitaph for the Hawker Hurricane, it's this. It was one of the most underrated, yet most versatile aircraft in the history of air warfare. And it was decisive in every battle it was involved with. Although it may not be the glamorous aeroplane, somehow the old Hurricane will always find its corner. The maneuverability and its general toughness and the way it could take punishment it gave us the great joy of feeling, well, thank God we've got hurricanes on our side.
Friday, decisive weapons continues with the Great Battle of Midway, the conflict between the USA and Japan that established the aircraft carrier as World War II's decisive weapon. Seven o'clock, Friday.